Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Baptist Church Online. New experience for all of us. I hope you are all well and doing okay. We're praying for you. Uh, I know you're praying for one another. It's been really good to see. So I'm going to pray right now, and then when I finish praying, uh, the group are going to lead us in our first couple of songs. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we come to you this morning in the strong, powerful, and mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we do that, we have great confidence and great boldness because that name is the name that stands above every other name. It is the name that is eternal. It is the name that resounds in heaven at this very moment. We thank you that we join with the angels uh, in worship to you. Although we can't be together this morning in the usual way, we thank you that by your spirit we are bound together. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you died and you shed your blood to make this possible. Father, as always, we pray this morning that you would accept our prayers, that you would hear our prayers, and that you would come amongst your people to bless us and to do us good. Father, right now, would you settle down the homes, uh, the spaces, the rooms where people are meeting. Lord, we would even pray that you would have your hand upon the technology, that your hand would be upon even the very internet itself, that, Lord, this morning, your word would get out. Father, your word says that if your people don't praise you, the rocks will cry out. Oh Lord, this morning we have no intention of being silent. The church marches on. We are people of the King and we will praise you. We will celebrate your victory and your goodness. We will not allow the rocks to have to cry out because you have given us the confidence in that strong, precious, holy and mighty name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to him we come as before him we bow. We pray these things and ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together.
read for you Psalm number 39. Psalm number 39. So if you have a Bible where you are, or you have the Bible downloaded onto your tablet or your mobile phone, it's an opportunity to turn there now. If you don't have a Bible, as I say, I'm going to read it for you in your hearing. If you need a Bible, by the way, um, I am able to get you a Bible. Let me know. Pick us a message on Facebook. Uh, send me an email, PM me on my own Facebook page, whatever. Get in touch. Make sure you've got the things that you need to be able to do church in this uh, new way. Uh, and certainly, if you haven't got a Bible or you would like a Bible, then uh, let me know. We can get that sorted out for you. Just as you're turning in your Bibles, let me tell you about a brand new leaflet that Roger Carswell, a well-known British evangelist, has put together. Um, it's called Hope Beyond a Coronavirus. And uh, it's, a, it's a very well put together leaflet. It's had a lot of publicity. We've ordered 200 of these. And I think we're going to end up ordering several more. But um, if you want some of these, we're initially going to put 50 at the church. If you'd like to come and grab a couple of those, please do give them away uh, to your friends and to your neighbours. Maybe you're already using the little calling card that Alison has put together. I hope you are just down your street so that we're able to be uh, in our community, showing love, showing action, even though we can't be together physically. This is a great little uh, tool, a great little resource that you can add into your, uh, your letterbox distribution. Um, the other thing to say is that, um, the other thing to say at this point in time is really that uh, we want to get these delivered into homes. So we'll be ordering more, we want to get them into the homes, probably certainly uh, around the areas and the neighbourhoods that we focus on and have that work and a witness in. So more information on that, but let us know we can make sure the church is open uh, so you can come and get those. Well, hopefully you're at uh, Psalm 39 and I'm going to read that for you. Psalm 39, to the choir master, this is the title. It's going to be important because we're going to consider the title this morning. To the choir master, to Yeduthu, a psalm of David. So this is David speaking. I said I will guard my ways, that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burnt. Then I spoke with my tongue. O oh Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths. And my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Don't make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute, I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. Well, let's pray again, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing that Really, there is, amongst the many, many concerns of this world at the moment, there is one thing upon all of our minds, and it is this virus that is, is causing the world to shut down. Father God, we come and we bow our knee before you. We seek you. We long for you. We're like the deer that's panting for you by streams of clear water. We need you, Lord God. Our nation needs you. This world needs you. Father God, it seems as if you are seeking 
a people for yourself to stand up and to proclaim the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, would you be amongst us as a people, be with us in our homes, be with us uh, in our workplaces where that is still possible, be with us as we seek to witness to you in a new way. Father God, we pray in particular this morning that you would be with those who are sick. Lord, there are people sick with many diseases, there are people sick with many illnesses. Father God, but we do pray for those who are sick with the coronavirus at the moment. Father God, for those perhaps who are very ill, and as we pray for them, we are mindful that coronavirus, like so many viruses and like so many illnesses and diseases, has the power to kill. And we pray for those who have lost their, for the families of those who have lost their lives. We pray, God, that you would be near to those who grieve, that those who grieve, who know you as their Lord and Saviour, would find joy and hope and peace, and that those who don't know you would come to know you through these awful times. We pray very much for our healthcare profession and for the scientists that are working to find vaccines and medicine and help in this time. We pray for our NHS workers very much. We pray for our GPs. We pray for those who man the 111 number, the ones who are at the other end of the uh, NHS online website answering queries. Father God, we pray that Lord, you would give great peace and capacity we pray, Father, for those who are counselling through this period, those who will have to uh, teach children of key workers. We pray for their safety. We pray, Lord God, that uh, there would be some sense of, uh, of purpose and order through all of these things. And as we think of education, we, we do think in particular of uh, those students, particularly students in year 11 and year 13 and university students whose futures are so uncertain at the moment because they don't know how their grades are going to pan out, how that's going to work. They are maybe even uh, sad and confused because they won't be able to fulfil that which they've been working for for so long. Lord, would you wrap your arms of love, your everlasting arms of love around such as these. God, give them some sense of closure and some ability to know the way forward in this confusion. Lord, draw young people, boys and girls, to bow the knee to you. And Father, we would pray for our government. Lord, at this, such a time as this, it, it perhaps doesn't matter too much what our political views are. We thank you for our leaders and we pray for their leadership. We pray that they would also see that, even flanked by chief scientific officers and chief medical officers, that the answers that can be given are limited and the only answers that can come of hope are from heaven. So be with our leaders, we pray. Be with our Prime Minister Boris Johnson. We pray that you would lead him wisely and that he would listen and be guided by the advice that he has given, but that he will come to know you, whom to know is life. And Father, we ask that in our families, as we've gathered just now in front of a screen, that as we've prayed, that Lord, this oddness, this strangeness would be somehow wonderful. That this would be a beautiful time of worship for your people. And for any who are coming in online and have never been to church, may they see the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ that passes all understanding. We plead these things before you, asking too for the forgiveness of our sin, and knowing that in you we are accepted and made whole. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, sing again, shall we? And then we'll look at that passage in the Word of God together.
But if you have a Bible, turn back into the passage that we read together, Psalm 39. Let me ask you a question. I wonder who rules the roost in your home? Who's the head of the house? Who calls the shots? Um, I reckon you can probably work out who that is by who has access to the television remote control, most of all. That tends to be the way it is in our house. Whoever has the TV seems to be the one that's uh, that's in charge. But I wonder who rules the roost. Is it mum, dad? I reckon for some of you, you know who you are because I see your videos on Facebook, I think it's the cat, isn't it? Seriously, the cat rules the roost of many of your homes. You know who you are. Who's the head of the house? We don't really like that phrase these days, though, do we? We don't often hear about people being the head of the house, or the man being the head of the house. It sounds a little bit patriarchal, maybe a little bit chauvinistic, maybe a little bit overbearing. These are not things that we're used to hearing. That sort of language has has gone out of the window somewhat. But families, like any group, or any organisation, or any association, need heads, don't they? Families need somebody to lead them. It's interesting in this Psalm 39 that there is a name that stands at the head of this name, of this psalm, sorry. You might think that the name that stands at the head of it is is Almighty God. Well, it's not the name in the text, but it's certainly implied and made clear as we go through the, the body of the passage. You might also think that the name is King David, because it's David's psalm. It says there, doesn't it? If you just look at that little title in Psalm 39, you can see there that it says, it is a psalm of David. This is David's psalm. But no, that's not the name that I'm thinking about. The name that stands at the head of this psalm is the name of a man who we meet as the choir master. He's introduced to us by his job title, the choir master. And we see his uh, name there. And you pronounce his name, Yeduthu, Yeduthu. So this is the choir master, Yeduthu, and it is Yeduthu's name that stands as the head of this particular passage. Now who was uh, Yeduthu? Well, Yeduthu was a worship leader in the uh, Israelite temple. He was one who would lead the people in worship and in praise, and he was the head of his family. He was the head of the tribes uh, in his family even, so he had a significant and a, a prominent role. He was, a, he was the head of a group of people as a worship leader. So let me read for you from the Old Testament, First Chronicles uh, chapter 15, verse 16, because this is the group that this man, Yeduthu, was a part of. It says in First Chronicles 15, uh, verse 16, David, no, that's King David who wrote this psalm. David also commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers, who should play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals, to raise sounds of joy. So Yeduthun was one of these worship leaders, and he was loud. He, he made the people play their musical instruments and bang their cymbals and play the lute and all this sort of thing loudly. In fact, Yeduthun's name means praise. This man exuded praise, joy, celebration to Almighty God. But he was also a man known personally to King David and was... Uh, very important indeed to King David, because in the second part of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 35, verse 15, we read these words. I'll just turn there in my own Bible, 2 Chronicles, chapter 35, verse 15. We read these things uh, about, uh, about Yeduthu. The singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their place according to the command of the king, and Asaph and Heman and here we are, Yeduthu, the king's seer, and the gatekeepers were at each gate. They didn't need to depart from their service for their brothers, the Levites, prepared for them. So Yeduthu is a seer, he's a wise man, he's an advisor, political, royal advisor to King David. And it's his name that stands at the head. He's going to lead this psalm. So David has entrusted this psalm to Yeduthu uh, to put some music, to arrange, so that he can be the leader. Yeduthu can be the leader of worship when it comes to the singing of this song. We're going to spend three weeks, the next three Sundays, looking at this 
psalm uh, together. So here's the first part this morning, and uh, we're going to take it apart and apply it to our lives. Because this psalm of David is a sorrowful psalm. It's a, it's a lament in many ways. And uh, it's an interesting psalm for David to give to Yeduthun. It's not the only psalm that Yeduthun has. He has a few others as well. But this is a sorrowful psalm. And David gives it to the man whose name means praise to set to music. So Yeduthun's yeah, got a job to do here, but we're going to look at this because this psalm, uh, written 3,000 years ago, speaks into our lives and our very circumstances even today. But just before we get into the body of the text, I just want to come back to that idea of, of headship. As I say, David is trusting Yeduthun yeah, to lead and apply the worship, his worship, to Almighty God. That's why Yeduthun's yeah, name stands as the head over this psalm, the name leading the worship to God in this psalm. Now, I just want to speak to you men for one moment, the men of this Baptist church. You men who are sitting there, perhaps having struggled to get your wives and your children to join you at quarter to eleven to worship in very odd ways. I just want to speak to you because getting your families together in your homes around a screen to sing songs, to read the Bible and listen to a sermon preached in this context, in the context you find yourselves in at the moment, is going to be a very weird and strange thing to do. It's kind of cringy, let's be honest. A little awkward, particularly if you have children. If you thought dragging the kids to church for a quarter to eleven every Sunday morning was hard, I think you're going to find that that's a piece of cake compared to getting them together as a family to sing and to uh, hear preaching. So men, I'm calling you this morning. Whatever your household situation is, even if it's just you're the man and the cat, or whether you've got a whole tribe of kids, I'm calling you men to be yeduthus in your households. I'm asking you to patiently and lovingly and gently stand as the head over these times of online worship. And as you seek to be a Yeduthun in that context, be like the Lord Jesus Christ who never shouted, and never forced or cajoled people to worship him. He lovingly led them, didn't he, to worship where people could see that he was worthy of worship. Men, will you do that? Will you lovingly lead your families and just see what God will do in such times as these? But maybe you're one of the many ladies in our church and you happen to be the only Christian in your family. Your husband isn't a believer, your children don't believe. And you're thinking, well, this is a pressure. What a struggle it's going to be to find a quiet place with an unbelieving husband and children to watch online at 10.45am every Sunday. Can I just say to you, don't despair. Persevere. You are already being salt and light in your homes. You are already uh, priestesses in your contexts. We're praying with you that through this season of self-isolation, by your witness and by your desire, to continue to worship Jesus, your husbands and your partners would be saved through this. That your unbelieving husbands and partners might in time become Yeduthu in your own home. That they might lovingly lead you to a place of worship and your entire family to a place of worship to Almighty God. And then perhaps you're not, not church people at all watching this, you've just found the link on, on the website or on Facebook or, or you've come directly to YouTube. This is all new to you, but you're a bit curious. You think it's worth checking out, well, good on you for doing that. But why don't you two nominate one person in your house, one person in your house, to lead people to get around the screen every Sunday morning to see our online worship service? Because if you come, if you lead and go to the, the service on a Sunday or watch it later on in the week, here you will find answers that the world cannot give. And you will find a peace that the world cannot know. We're all in this together. Maybe 
you don't fit into any of those categories because there's Sunday morning, you find that you are home alone, you're watching this by yourself, or maybe you are with a whole tribe of people. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whoever you are, whatever your context, it's new to all of us, but I believe the Holy Spirit can still work and encourage us. Amen? Okay, well let's briefly look together at these first three verses and then we'll get into some more stuff next week, God willing. So let me read verses one to three and just the first two words of verse four as well. So David says, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me as I mused the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, O Lord, make me know my end. And uh, well, we we're going to finish up, O Lord. So I spoke with my tongue, O Lord, and we'll finish that uh, as our, our portion for today. Well, what's going on here? Well, you know, David is inviting us to peer into a rather awkward scene here. It's the kind of scene, you, you'll have had this experience, I'm sure, where you walk into a room and there's a couple of people and clearly the situation is a little bit tense. There's been a bit of a row or a bit of an exposure of some sort. And you, you walk in and you go, oh, awkward, I'll come back later. You shut the door and off you go again. It's that kind of thing, that kind of scene that we're being invited to look into here. A rather awkward one at that. It is tense. Now why? Well, it's because God has shown David something about his life that God is displeased with. God is showing David something that he has done or something that he has said that is bad. God is showing David his sin and God does that to us. He shows us where we are falling short of what he wants us to do. An old fashioned phrase we use is conviction of sin. God is convicting King David of his sin because you see King David who ruled about 1000 BC was the king of Israel, was God's chosen man, the man that would, would through a covenant made with David, God would bring about the Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was that man, he was far from perfect. He did some atrocious things. And again, God is showing King David something of that. He's convicting him of his sin, showing him where he falls short. Now you might think, if God loves us, why does he show us where we are falling short? That's not really very nice. Why does God want to show people that he loves where they're falling short? I mean, if teachers do that in school today, if they just tell the kids what they're doing wrong all the time, they're probably not going to be teachers for long. What we want to hear is that actually we're rather decent people and that we are doing okay. But that's the point. You see, David is being convicted by God that just like me, and indeed you, just like us, David is not really great. Only Jesus is really great. Only Jesus was the only really great human being ever to have lived because Jesus never did sin. He was never convicted of his own sin because he never sinned. And yet, of course, we know, don't we, that he was convicted of being a sinner and he was sentenced to death on a cross for it. And although his accusers could find no sin or guilt in him, they hated him so much that they, they murdered him anyway. You see, you see, it wasn't his own sin that he bore on the cross, it was, it was mine. It was a sin of all who trust in him. And he took my sin, he took the sin of all who will trust in him to that cross, so that when God convicts us of our sin and shows us that we do deserve the sentence of death, he shows us that by faith in him, by faith in Jesus, our guilt is removed and we are justified. We're justified in God's sight because Jesus dies as our substitute. He dies in our place that we might go free. Yes, God loves you. And so lovingly, he shows us what we need to do to be built up and to be encouraged, but through faith in Jesus, rather than being built up in our own strength, because in our own strength, we fall short and we fail. This is what David's problem was here. The only way to be truly built up is to be brought up in Jesus. And to hear God lovingly convict you of your sin in order 
that we might turn to him in repentance and faith. So that's what's going on. That's what David is doing as we enter this awkward room here in verses 1 and 2. God has shown him he's fallen short. And in response, David hasn't done what naturally we all want to do when we're told we're fallen short. He doesn't argue with God. He doesn't shake a fist at God in light of what God has said to him. He's accepted what God has said and he's decided to shut up. He's decided it's rather pointless arguing with God. So instead he says, I'm not going to speak, I'm going to ponder and meditate on my ways before you. I'm going to meditate on what I'm like, God, and what you are like. But as he comes good on his silence, we read it goes rather bad for him inside. So in verses 2 and 3, the language he uses is kind of like this. His distress, and this is what's happening in his silence, his distress grew. His heart became hot. And it was like his insides were on fire. Think about it almost as if David has, in light of his sin, he's decided to self-isolate. He's not self-isolating because of the coronavirus, but because of that virus, and we talked about this last Sunday morning when we were all together, the virus that is sin, a virus that has a 100% mortality rate, everybody dies. We die because we're, we're sinners. So David is kind of self-isolated. He's not talking to anyone as he ponders his sins, as he ponders who God is. But the problem is, is he's self-isolating. He's become incredibly tormented and very distressed. So this is going to be key. How David responds now is going to be key for David's spiritual health. How is he going to come out of this? It's going to be key for his uh, mental and emotional state as well. It's going to be key that he deals with this torment and this distress appropriately. Now, how are you planning to deal with the, 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 the huge impact of self-isolation self and social distancing? How are you going to deal with that? More importantly, a big question that we all need to ask ourselves is, how are you going to deal with the huge impact of hearing God say, all of sin and fall short of his glory? We're already seeing on a massive scale, unprecedented scale, aren't we? that the fear, the fear in our society is causing dreadful torment and distress. Maybe like David, you are saying, my distress grows, my heart becomes hot, and it's like my insides are on fire. <coughs> so in conclusion, how, how can we deal with this? How can we deal with this? Well, let's just see how David deals with this awful distress and torment. Look at the second part of verse 3. He says, As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. I like how the message translation puts this verse. It says, My thoughts boiled over. I spilled my guts. Isn't that great? My thoughts boiled over. I spilled my guts. Maybe you've been in that kind of place before when you, you just can't hold it in anymore and it all blurts out. And how it comes out is key, isn't it? It's so important to get it right when you say what you really think, when your guts spill over. So what we need is somebody to cry out to in our distress and torment who's bigger than not just me or you, but bigger than fear, bigger than the coronavirus. Indeed, somebody who is bigger in the fact they are other, they are different to any of us. Someone, in fact, who is omnipotent who rules and reigns with power, which is a power other to any power on the world. And we need to know that when we cry out to such a person, that that person is there. Despite being all powerful, that they are actually listening. That they will listen when our guts spill over. But they're also more, more than just a listening ear. That they will actually, in time and space, be able to give us hope. Friends, that person is the God who made you. Can you believe that? That the God who made you, the God whom we've rebelled against, the God who by right should consume and crush us with his righteous settled control wrath, loves us so much and gives us hope. Hope that is anchored around his very own throne set in heaven. So David's first words after his period, period of agonising silence are there in verse 4. O Lord, O Lord, who is this Lord? 
This isn't a Lord like Darth Vader. You know, Lord Vader all mean and scary. He's not a Lord like Scar, but he's a Lord like Mufasa. Not Denethor, but Aragorn. Not the White Witch, but Aslan. You see, David knows this Lord as his own personal friend and saviour in the midst of great difficulty and fear. That's why a few Psalms earlier, in Psalm 34, verse 8, David himself invites us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Come and taste and see. And what it's like when you've got a meal and it just tastes bland. You, you season that meal, you put salt, pepper in it, a dash of Worcester sauce, some herbs in there as well. Bring out the flavour. And when we have very bland, very frightening circumstances like coronavirus, we need to season our lives, and season our fear, season our circumstances with the Lord himself. To taste and see that the Lord is good. Who is this Lord? Well, two Bible references for you, and then we're done. First, Paul writing over a thousand years later, Jesus has now gone back to heaven after having come to the earth at Bethlehem and died and risen again. He's back in heaven. Paul writes these words in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Therefore God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Jesus' name is above every other name, including names like cancer, coronavirus, virus, suffering. His name stands above those names, names like death, Names like self-isolation, social uh, distancing. His name stands above it all because he's defeated all of those things on that cross where he was convicted for our sin if we trust in him by faith. So God has highly exalted Jesus, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess, here we are, that Jesus Christ is Lord's. Oh Lord, that's who we need to cry out to. And just in case you're still in any doubt that this is a Lord who's more like Darth Vader, overbearing, overpowering, then, well, just one more text, this time from the second letter Paul wrote to Thessalonians. It's in the New Testament, a part of our Bibles. This is what Paul says about Jesus. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. You see, Jesus is Lord eternally and therefore his comfort and peace, as it says in that passage, are eternal comfort. That's why the comfort that Jesus gives is better than the comfort anybody else can give, because quite simply the comfort that Jesus gives is eternal. It stands above it all. It's not rocked by viruses, it's not rocked by war, it's not rocked by famine and disaster. It's stable and it's available to all who will call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I implore you to, to do that, even this morning, that as you face an unknown tomorrow, you can face it with the one who is Lord of all. Amen. Let's sing together our final song, shall we?
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you.